Hey there, Robert. How are you doing? Okay, Glenn, how are you? I'm all right. It's pandemic time over here and, you know, starting to get a little bit boring after a year. But pandemics that, get old. I can't complain. Yeah. And <laughs> very quickly. Yeah. Uh, this is Glenn Lowry. We're at the Glenn Show, bloggingheads.tv and patreon.com forward slash Glenn Show. And I have the great pleasure of talking with Robert Wright, uh, who is the uh, founder of the Blogging Heads Enterprise and uh, has many other credits to his credit that he will tell you about <laughs> as he chooses to. And we're here talking. I'm not sure about exactly what, but it's always good to talk to Bob. Yeah. Uh, Bob? Thanks, Glenn. I am, I am co-founder of Blogging Heads. Uh, I started it 15 years ago with Mickey Kaus and Greg Dingle, the tech genius. Um, and yeah, you, you were on from pretty early. Uh, I think Josh Cohen brought you on first. Um, and then yeah, you, it was 2007, I think, when I did my first blogging hits. So that's 14 years, 13 and a half years ago. Yeah. Well, you're having a great run. And now you, you keep going to the next level. I, I don't know how long this can continue, but you keep going to, uh, to higher levels of uh, prominence, uh, erudition, and so on. Thank you, Robert. Uh, it's uh, something I never would have envisioned myself doing. I thought podcasting was for kids, uh, and it turns out that <laughs> that it has awakened the kid in me, or something. Uh, but uh, you know, it's 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 uh, an important part of my life now. I, I'm uh, I look forward to the conversations. Uh, Mick Warder and I have developed a, a, a something of a brand, and 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 a, it's an extended conversation over years on race related issues. But the platform affords me the chance to talk to all kinds of people uh, about ideas, about books, about politics, about culture. Um, so for a guy like me who, you know, likes to read novels and think about uh, philosophy and politics, as well as doing my economics, academic stuff, it's, it's just, uh, just perfect. Yeah. So I'm, I, I owe it all to you, Bob. I wouldn't go that far, Glenn. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's worked out well. I mean, probably somebody would have had the wisdom to give you a platform of this kind. Uh, the, the, um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's uh, I'm delighted. Uh, and as you know, uh, the, the, the launching of kind of the latest version of your show, the Patreon version, got a lot of help from our uh, colleague, Nikita. Um, he deserves, he deserves credit. If people are wondering who does Nikita the cool Petrov and Nikita Petrov, Nikita Petrov. Yeah. Uh, so if people are wondering who does the cool, uh, the cool art, the, the cool, the cool uh, pictures of you and John sometimes that show up on, on YouTube and elsewhere, that would be Nikita. And that's, that's only one of several contributions um, that he makes on an ongoing basis. Um, but yeah, I'm, never so I'm looking forward to, to what's that? No, I was just going to say it never occurred to me to, um, you know, develop the the podcast in a in the commercial direction that Patreon affords the opportunity to, to do. But for the encouragement, uh, you know, from you and the very practical uh, guidance of Nikita, who made it seem feasible to me, where it was so intimidating, only because you know I'm not as technologically adept as the next fellow. Yeah, I know that feeling. Um, so, uh, shortly before we started taping, you, uh, made clear to me your expectation that I would be guiding the conversation, even though it's the Glenn show. Uh, I, 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 uh, I thank you for that honor. I, I can't say I've really prepared for it, but I would, uh, I, I, at some point, as you know, I wanted to talk about, uh, some stuff I'm doing and we'll get to that, but why don't we talk about your stuff a little more? Um, and where you're kind of fitting into the conversation and, and a few questions that arise as I listen to you and John or you and you and uh, various other people. Um, oh, OK, the uh, I mean, first of all, how would you characterize. You know, if God came down and said, justify what you're doing right now, what contribution are you making to. To the world. What would you say? 
<laughs> okay, so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm resisting the temptation to be self-aggrandizing right now. And uh, God might smite you for that. So that's probably <laughs> wise. Characterize my enterprise as, you know, at some uh, level of uh, saving civilization or something like that. Um, I'm in a sustained argument with the zeitgeist about the nature of the country in relation to the unresolved issues of uh, race, racial domination and subordination, inequality, exclusion. Uh, discrimination and so on. Um, and it's not the only thing I'm doing by any means, but it's the main, it seems to me, it's the main crux of the matter. I, I think the discourse is off the rails, badly, historically wrongheaded, and uh, feel that I, have something to say about that. Uh, not necessarily, I say my mouth is no prayer book, you know, not like I've, you know, got the answer or something like that, but that I've, I've got some something to say. And I feel like I'm playing this role of the gadfly of, of, of the person stepping out from the consensus. And I know, as I say, it sounds self-aggrandizing. That's why I hesitated to go down this road in the first place. But um, uniquely situated to be able to articulate certain lines of concern that otherwise might not be effectively communicated. So something like that. So I'm, I'm trying to make that kind of contrarian uh, outside of the, of the box. Uh, intervention in the national conversation about justice and uh, racial equity. And when you say the conversation has gone off the rails, how would you characterize the problem in kind of the most generic way possible, if that makes sense, or at the highest level of abstraction or something? So here's a stab at that. Um, I've put this in some things that I've written uh, for popular venues, like in the City Journal and lectures that I've given, I say you have two narratives that conflict with each other, the bias narrative and the development narrative. And the bias narrative is white supremacy has done us wrong. America has its knee on the neck. Uh, black uh, exclusion, discrimination, uh, and, and so on. Historical injustice, mass incarceration is in effect a conspiracy to confine black people. I mean, that puts it a little bit too sharply, but is ipso facto, et cetera, a um, manifestation of an age old story. George Floyd dying in Minneapolis is, but the 21st century extension of Emmett Till being killed uh, in the South in the 1950s, bias, white supremacy, uh, uh, racial domination, racial exclusion, the bias narrative. I want to contrast that with the development narrative in which I put center place the incomplete project of empowering African Americans who had been, have been impacted adversely by history to acquiring the capacities of function and performance that allow for effective competition in a world that is basically a level playing field. Of course, it's not completely and perfectly a level playing field, but that the question should be, if I take incarceration as a case in point, I've got kids, young adults, behaving in ways that are socially disruptive, manifesting in that behavior, the incomplete process of their own socialization and human development, acting out in ways that are destructive, one can certainly give accounts of how it is that they and a community full of people like them might have come to be in the situation that they are. But the first order imperative is at the acquisition of skills, the acculturation of patterns of behavior, the redress of the uh, background social conditions that led to this dysfunction. 
uh, the, the redress of those developmental deficits manifested in their behavior, which led to them being incarcerated. These are two radically different ways of looking at the problem of overrepresentation of African Americans amongst those who are incarcerated, which I give as only one example of this larger okay. of this larger phenomenon. Where you see gaps, disparity, and deficits, your story about them can either be the system is so rigged as to exclude, or it can be, and of course these are not mutually exclusive. I, I use this only to characterize the terrain in the stark way that you asked me to do. Um, exclusion and discrimination and bias or performance and behavior and development. And I'm saying the latter. So you, you take something like affirmative action. Now, you know, there's a whole big legal argument about it, but get down to the basics of it. African-American kids presenting test scores that are low relative to the test scores being presented by others who would like to get into this exclusive uh, line of the school or whatever. Now, there is racism, there is, uh, uh, you know, implicit bias, there are, there are all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, imperfections and whatnot. But if you have a persistent phenomenon of substantial quantitative disparities and the measured performance on intellectual work by race, your solution to that can't be changing the standards so as to accommodate the difference and still get the numbers right. That's not justice. That's not uh, equality. That, that's a corrupt, uh, cowardly avoidance of a historic challenge of actually acknowledging, reckoning with, and redressing the performance differences that are reflected uh, in these tests. The reflex to get rid of the instrument of assessment because it reports to us the objective fact of racial disparities in performance must be resisted. It infantilizes the people on behalf of whom it's been undertaken. It's the easy way out for the institutions that purport to ad, uh, advocate for, for justice and fairness, but that in fact simply want not to acknowledge the problem and et cetera. So I could go on in this vein for a long time, but okay. you, see, you see the distinction that I'm making. So yeah. So uh, that's my, that's the, at least that's one of my, uh, I mean, I, there are other points, but that's one of my, my, my central points where I feel like I've got my finger on something important uh, that uh, the, the zeitgeist has got wrong. Okay. Um, so you, you think in a certain sense, buying into the bias narrative is unhealthy for the people that uh, supposedly, um, the 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 people advancing the bias narrative are trying to help, uh, and that 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 could in principle be the case, even if there's a lot of validity to the bias narrative. Right, that could be the case. You're also saying that you wonder how much validity there is, at least in the sense that you think we've got a pretty pretty fair playing field. Uh, but at the same time, it could be that we could have a one that's more unfair than you believe to be the case. And it could still be the case that the bias narrative is just an unhealthy thing to walk around with, right? That's in principle possible. Yeah, that's in principle possible. Let me let me um let me ask you about the the conversation itself. Uh, I mean, we are said to be, and I think we are in a time when it is hard to communicate effectively with people who disagree with you about important issues, right? That's a, the, you know, the polarization, the tribalism, whatever you want to call it. Uh, how, how happy are you with the, the way your message is or is not resonating and who it is or isn't resonating with? I'm almost completely in despair <laughs> about it, Bob, to be completely honest with you. I mean, uh, again, I have to acknowledge in advance that anything I say here is bound to seem to be uh, self-promoting or self-aggrandizing in some way or another. The intensity of vilification and the ferocity 
of people's uh, reaction who don't like what I'm saying unsettles me. I, I mean, it, it's not just that Twitter has mobs. Twitter has mobs. I know that Twitter has mobs. Uh, or that there are people in the comment section who are trolls. I, I know that that's the case. But, but um, you know, I don't take too kindly to being called a hack, Bob. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're not you alone. Know, I, I'm a fellow of the Econometric Society. I'm a distinguished fellow of the American Economics Association. I've published an econometric of the American Economic Review, the Journal of Political Economy, the Quarterly Journal of Economics, the Review of Economic Studies, the Journal of Labor Economics. There are Wikipedia articles about research papers that I have written. Some of my papers have thousands of citations. I'll stop, okay? Yeah, we don't, want God, God, we don't want God to smite you. We don't want there's God no, to smite there's you. There's no way that I'm a hack, okay? There's no way that I'm <laughs> a can hack. Rule. I'm willing to stipulate that you're not a hack. Let's, rule, let's take that possibility off the table. Well, Moreover, I, I mean, and I'll just go on in this vein for just a moment to try to make the point. You've asked me how I am experiencing the discourse, and I say it sometimes drives me to despair. And one of the things that causes me that is the vitriolic way in which I am received by people who simply have a different opinion than me about affirmative action or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, there, yeah. Well, I was just going to say there probably are people who have been criticized by you and or John McWhorter on your show, who feel, the same who way. feel that you have uh, sometimes yeah. uh, spoken about them in, let's say, an animated tone. OK, now, <laughs> uh, fair enough. Perhaps I draw some of this vitriol by the way in which my rants veer off into a vitriolic dismissal of certain people with three names who I don't have to name here, whom I've called empty suits and lightweights and so forth and so on so okay fair enough uh maybe i'm uh maybe i'm poisoning the well a little bit and i i do take responsibility for losing it sometimes okay i'm sorry i i apologize uh, but, but, so, there is but, that, but that, let me just finish the point yeah. because a similar disquiet sometimes overtakes me when i read uh, affirmations and celebrations of what i've said huh. by by people who comment in effect, thank God there's some sensible black people in this country who see the world the way I see it. Some of these people are Donald Trump supporters unavowedly so, I mean, avowedly so, uh, who say in effect, yeah, finally somebody gets it right, who, who um, in effect take comfort from the critical line that I'm taking on behalf of positions uh, I'll just mention one, racial realism. These are the people who think there are essential differences between the racial populations that account for contemporary socioeconomic disparities in a one-to-one -one or direct way. Uh, and they say, well, why don't you just take the next step, Lowry? You're almost there. You're almost there. And that is also unsettling, especially as I realize that part of the vitriol coming from the people who reject what I say is motivated by an observation about the warm glow feeling that I seem to give to some people who like what I'm mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? No, it's uh, it's hard. I mean, life on the internet is hard. I mean, if you have a, a platform of any prominence, people, unless you're super boring, there are going to be people saying horrible things about you. But you've definitely gotten more than your share. And and although I did, although I did suggest that you know viewed. Uh, from the other side, you might look like part of the problem. There is an asymmetry, a genuine asymmetry that I believe is the case here, which is that I think you are willing to have a discussion slash debate with any of the people you're criticizing. And few of them are willing to have one with you so far as I can tell. Is that not the case? That's the case, Robert. Thank you for noticing that. And I would just go one step further on this campaign of self-aggrandizement. I'm also capable of articulating in detail exactly what they believe, even as I reject it. Hmm. And they would not be able to know how to begin to give a coherent and nuanced account of what it is that I'm on behalf of. They, their representations of me are all stick-figured and uh, sloganeering and you know, mm -hmm. platitude. Something like that. Um, yeah. Do, do you have any? I mean, looking at the at the the 
the so-called pro- the polarization problem. The, 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 you know, uh, what you're describing is part of a generic problem. You see it in wholly other realms of policy discussion and wholly other realms of, of discourse where the two sides are, are, uh, are just not, not communicating. Have you, have you, do you have any thoughts about how to, uh, it seems like a pretty stubborn problem to me. I think about it a lot. Do you have any thoughts about how to start making inroads in it? I, I don't. And uh, forgive me because it is an important problem. Uh, but, but I, but I, it seems to me that it is a consequence of technological developments that allow for people to cluster around, you know, networks of uh, interaction that are mutually affirming and to give easy voice to their disapproval. And I mean, you know, there's this thing where I, you know, I wonder, I think very consciously, I don't know if you do, but I'll bet you do about what I retweet. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I used to just retweet stuff that I thought was interesting that I agreed with or that I didn't agree with. You know, it was just that I thought it was entertaining. And now I have to ask myself, <laughs> I have to ask myself, do I want to be known as the person who retweeted this thing? And oh, yeah. often the answer is no, even though I kind of think it would be interesting to have my my followers uh, aware of something, I, 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 I won't retweet it because I don't want to elicit the, you know, the, the angry uh, blowback of the assumptions that my act of retweeting connoted something about myself that may or may not be true. And I'm just thinking if I multiply that kind of thing a gazillion times, I'm going to end up with a, a structure of interaction amongst individuals where, which is very, you know, stilted and artificial. And um, there's going to be a lot of preference falsification and, and, and a lot of self-censorship and a lot of virtue signaling in it. Um, and it's, it's going to make, make the extreme voices the only one that venture into the, the, the territory, you know, the, the voices that are close to the line and not quite sure or be afraid to say anything because they don't want to appear to be too right. much this or that. So well, no, I think that's a, a big part of the problem is that, uh, you know, um, reticence and moderation of tone and civility are not rewarded. I mean, the people who have none of feel none of the constraints you've just described feeling. The people who just, you know, are willing to, to, to go out with, uh, you know, at, at full volume and uh, are, I think, often the people who have the easiest time building up the big uh, Twitter followings. I mean, outrage is a successful model. I mean, trolling people is a successful uh, social media model. And um, and, you know, uh even leaving that aside, in other words, there, there, there is value if you're trying to build a big Twitter following in antagonizing the other tribe. And one reason there's value in that is that then your own tribe sees you as fighting the bad guys. And if, if the bad guys hate you, you must be a good guy. And, and then you get more and more followers. Uh, and, and, you, and, and you can get followers by doing things that I think are extremely uh, counterproductive, such as seizing on like the stupidest thing done or said by anyone in the other tribe and magnifying that as if it's typical of the other tribe. Right. I mean, it's like uh, one example of this is like uh, you see video of somebody freaking out about being told to wear a mask in a supermarket and they're a Trump supporter. Let's say they've got a MAGA hat on. Well, if you're in like the resistance tribe, you can you can get a lot of mileage out of circulating that video and probably even more mileage out of saying something to the effect of, you know, typical Trump supporter, at least at least with that being the subtext. Right. Yeah. And people will get outraged. And, and then and, and then the people in your tribe will be even more convinced that the Trump tribe is full of crazy people and so on. And, and it works right. in both directions. I just chose one side, but, but uh, you know, the, the, it just seems to me that the incentives uh, are just largely unhealthy in terms of what it takes. I mean, I mean, the, the generic point is that the way you build up a big following in your tribe, the way you see your own stature rise in your tribe is by increasing antagonism between the tribes. So, the more bad you do, the more power you get. And the more power you get, the more bad you can do. 
that's where we are. And, and I'm like you, I'm, I'm like, I, 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 I'm just, uh, I, I, I very often find myself deciding not to retweet, not to tweet. Um, and I probably should, be, I, I probably should, should feel that I should obey that, that, uh, that reticence less often probably, but, um, it's bad. Well, I wonder if now that uh, Trump is gone, is he gone? <laughs> He's off of whether Twitter. Things are going to be, <laughs> yeah, whether it's it's going to be less so, because that it seems to me, at least in my experience, was was one of the things, this large area of Trump, this and that, one of the areas where people, the lines are very sharply drawn and. You have to be very careful what you say. Uh, yeah, I think he I mean, the problem precedes him. He he did a good job of exploiting the dynamic, I think. Sure. He's someone who is who succeeded by generating outrage in the other tribe. Um, the problem precedes him. As you said, I think part of it is technological. I, I am a little heartened by the seemingly growing awareness of the problem. And 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 the, and the greater discussion of the problem. Um, I have some ideas about things we might. Well, here's an idea. I mean, you're you're you're. This isn't isn't uh, totally outside of your domain. I mean, you're an economist. You think about not totally unrelated things. I mean, I, I think that. Uh, well, there was a good. Did you see this piece in in the Wall Street Journal, um, co-authored by Frank Fukuyama and someone else about middleware? I did not see it. Well, this has been a hobby horse of mine for some time. I have long felt that, first of all, the government should tell Facebook, Twitter, you've got to make your algorithms public. People deserve to know what uh, what algorithm is steering their attention from one thing to another and how what they click on is is shaping the next thing they're going to be shown. Now, obviously, if you if you say to people, OK, here's the algorithm, it's just a bunch of computer code. I can't make sense of it. But if they had to offer uh, what is it? A, a, an API is something programming interface. Anyway, an API is what lets people build products on your software. And the middleware that Frank and his co-author were advocating in this journal piece would be stuff that other you know, once these algorithms are transparent and people are allowed to build on them. You could have a third party software maker come in. And so my Twitter control panel could say things like, uh, do you want to see uh, fewer outrageous tweets about X or um, or do you want to, um, you know, how high do you want the disinformation filter on this one subject? Or I mean, it could be along any dimension. It, it could be like, do you want to see uh, do you want to? not see things that are spreading too fast because often those are I, I'm just throwing throwing things out. Mm -hmm. But you would have software companies come in and put an interface on top of the Twitter or Facebook interface that okay. gave you an effect knobs. You could you could turn up or down. And the upshot would be you could you could settle on an algorithm that would be more conducive to your own mental health than what you have now or or could steer you toward another or, or just a particular subject area more effectively it could go in any number of directions and i think if the policymakers have the have the opportunity to do this they can well i can think of a couple of objections i don't know if they make sense one is if the algorithm is intellectual property of the company you're forcing me to make it public it's like having a drug company make public the you know the the source code so to speak on a pharmaceutical that mm -hmm. they're developing before they've had a chance to collect in the marketplace because they made a huge investment in creating it. Uh, so there's an intellectual property issue. I don't know how probative how in, you know important that would be. But the other thing I think is, if the algorithm is public, then the the universe responds to the knowledge about the algorithm. So this idea of making sure that my company's name comes up high in the search uh, uh, outcome if I'm trying to draw customers to me will be just the starting place for a whole huge 
industry of 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 content providers manipulating the algorithm in effect. Well, on that last point, I would say I suspect that the big companies, the big marketers that you would be most worried about manipulating you are already doing a good job of reverse engineering the algorithms and exploiting them. And the people who don't aren't allowed yeah. to take advantage of the algorithms, much less reshape them, are the common people. Yeah, and that's a point. now on the first point, uh, you know, like, wait, this is our intellectual property. My reply is life is hard. OK, <laughs> the government has power. It can it can declare you a monopolist, which, in fact, you you probably are. Now, I, I think, as I understand antitrust law, it is traditionally put what for my money is too much emphasis on whether you did something illicit to acquire the monopoly. I think the question should be, uh, look, is yeah. it a monopoly and is that having unhealthy effects? Yeah. I don't care whether my, Microsoft cheated to get the monopoly they had 20 years ago. And, 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 and why would you expect that cheating is involved? You, as you know, Glenn, when there's positive network externalities that are strong, a monopoly can just happen. And, and that I, my, right? my understanding was sure. My understanding was that it was always the case that the antitrust uh, restraint on open uh, free commerce was premised on effects not on not on causes that is to say the monopoly power was the problem not whether or not it was I, engendered by some illicit uh, activity i defer to you i mean i have gotten the sense from past cases that there was a certain amount of emphasis on how you got the monopoly but if i'm wrong i'm happy to hear it because i think the yeah, focus, I, i'm not an expert i'm not a, yeah. on the law you know? i mean in any event it's like when as more and more people agree a very small number of companies are having effects on society that could literally be so destabilizing that the country dissolves into chaos. I think if there aren't laws that allow us to intervene now, we should make we should pass those laws. You know, again, life is hard. I, I, I'm, I'm so sorry about Mark Zuckerberg's misfortune, but I think he'll be OK. Yeah, he'll be he'll be OK. What's interesting to me here is it's a political argument at the end of the day, not an economic argument. It's not about jacking up a price and extracting more profit than you're entitled to. It's about the social effects and the political spillover effects of people using your product in a particular way or of you mm -hmm. offering your product in a particular uh, way. And, and that's the motivation for the state intervention. And I think that's that's like uh, pornography licensing or something like that. It, it's it's uh, not a strictly economic argument. It's not a cultural argument, but it's more of a political than it is an economic argument. Something like that. But it, but that doesn't yeah. make it wrong. Yeah. No, you're right. It's it's very unlike in 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 its underlying logic traditional antitrust intervention. It's not about predatory pricing. It's not a you know. Um, but it, it's a new thing. And that's why I think and, and that's why it's just disappointing, you know, when they have these hearings and they have Mark Zuckerberg for Congress, you know, you listen to the quality of the questions. It's depressing. I mean, you know, I'm not sure that this would be the miracle cure. It might be that if you put this power in people's hands, they would misuse it and 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 and, and dig themselves into even deeper echo chambers or something. I don't know for sure. But it seems to me that uh, what's going on now is sufficiently unfortunate that we should experiment with alternatives. Anyway, that's people should Google that uh, the Wall Street Journal piece. The phrase is middleware. Uh, and and, uh, and Fukuyama is one of the two authors. Um, but it's a. It's a it's a problem. Let me ask you one more. Um, just one more question about your your stuff uh before i tell you about some of some stuff i'm doing the um the 1619 project yeah. uh you, you said you weren't going to mention people with three names I, I, okay i'll honor that <laughs> but the 16 uh the 1619 uh, project and the person who's identified with it as its uh primary author that's what? nicole hannah jones okay we've done it we've done well, it yeah. yeah, no, no, that's fair. She, she, uh, the um, uh, sometimes when I listen to John and you, there's so much 
common understanding between you two about what the problem of the 1619 project is that I want to intervene and say, hey, I'm a beginner. What is the problem? Now, I think I can know, I, I think I know one of your answers. One of your answers you've articulated already. It sustains the bias narrative. And uh, so you would say uh, fails to nurture, um, you know, the, the sense of agency, I guess you might say, uh, that that would be a healthy thing to have nurtured more in exactly the population that we're worried about here, right? Um, it, it would be something about the the, the practical effects uh, of the bias narrative. I have, but I have a separate question, which is: um, Is it because uh, I haven't looked into this? Is this egregiously wrong at kind of like a factual level or an historical level? I know there have been historians who had uh, big disagreements with it. Is it your sense that? It, it would be not hard at all to, to go through and show how some of its important claims are just off base as a factual matter. I think there's one huge important claim that is off base as a factual matter that is the source of a lot of that kind of criticism of the 1619 Project, which is that in uh, Hannah Jones's framing essay, she asserts that a primary factor in gendering the uh, the break with Britain, the revolution in uh, 1779, 80, 81, 82, had to do with a concern that the British were uh, uh, hostile to the slave trade and that people were motivated by the preservation of slavery. So that when she says something like, I'm not quoting exactly, America's founding ideals were wrong when they were stated and we've been working to make them true ever since, she's characterizing the revolution as somehow hypocritical or or uh, the assertions on behalf of liberty, uh, really a cloak for the uh, desire to carry on with the commerce and people. When in fact, of course, the founding fathers were divided about slavery. There were some of the states that came into the union, as you well know, that were slave states and there were other states that were uh, skeptical or hostile about that. And there was a compromise drawn. So, so that, characterization of motives that it's, it's my understanding i'm not a historian but my understanding having read what the historians have to say about this those who've been critical is that that's an overstatement that there were some uh active uh, elements in the resistance to british rule who did have a concern about the preservation of slaves uh and the extent to which uh, the british who's uh, uh they're declaring that slaves would find uh, liberation if they joined the uh, the the side of the crown and the revolution, whatnot. There was some of that going on, but to say that that was a primary factor was inaccurate. So there's that. Okay. I, I don't I don't regard the 1619 project as riddled with error, and you know, objectively, it, it's the narrative that's at stake. I use the word narrative again. I mean it in a slightly different sense. Here's how you tell the American story: 1619, the true founding of the country. Uh, the 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 uh, struggle to uh, uh, effort to defend slavery, the struggle to overturn it, the effort to exclude the African Americans, the struggle to include them being the uh, primary driving engine of American history. The, the, this is where I would uh, uh, find the uh, uh, root of my objection. Uh, I, I think slavery is not the American story. I think it's a part of the story. Uh, I think there's an important counterpoint uh, in both the founding generation, but also in the Civil War, the, the, the achievement of the emancipation of the slaves, and then the long story through the century from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement, the achievement of the incorporation of the slaves and their descendants into the Republic, this this uh, uh, fulfillment of the potentiality of the Enlightenment ideals that get framed in institutions by the founding of the United States of America. So I, I think it's a world historic achievement that African Americans uh, are the freest, most powerful, wealthiest, uh, most prosperous people of African descent in scores of millions in number here on no the North American continent, 
the the story here can't be it's and this is not only about not giving African Americans a sense of lack of agency. This is about being uh, faithful to the, uh, the 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 deepest truth about the American experience, uh, which is an affirmation of freedom. And a, you know, I could go into the Cold War. I could go into fighting fascism earlier in the 20th century. Uh, there, there's something important has happened here in the last couple of hundred years. And of course, the experience of African Americans and the dealing with the fact of slavery is an important, is an absolutely fundamental part of it. But it's not the whole story. It's, it's not the root of the story. In, in my opinion, in my inclination, my sensibility, that's what, it, not, that's what animates my resistance to the project. Now, hmm. now there's, you know, the 1619 project is not just Nicole Hannah Jones. Uh, it's Matthew Desmond' uh, essay on capitalism and the history of uh, race and capitalism in America. It's Brian Stevenson's essay on incarceration and the role that race has played in that. And we could parse those out. I don't believe that the country, uh, uh, the rise of capitalism in America is best told primarily through the lens of slavery, although it's obviously an important part of it. Uh, I think you can't have tens of millions of immigrants coming from Eastern and Southern Europe. You can't have cities springing up on the Eastern seaboard. You can't have industrialization. You can't have the building of the railroads. You, you, you can't have the whole American economy driven by slavery. That's, got, that's the tail wagging the dog. It's an important part of the story. Uh, I think you can't tell the story of incarceration without delving deeply into the racial history of the country. But again, it's not the whole story. Uh, the war on drugs is not simply an anti-black conspiracy um, or the uh, the proliferation of guns in America. It's not simply, you know, you, you don't want to talk about the settlement of the West. You you, you don't want to talk about a frontier uh, society. You, you, you know, all, all you've got is uh, this one note uh, narrative about uh, what's going on. This is not really history. So there are aesthetic, if you like, these are aesthetic uh, kind of objections to a, a, a narrative account that uh, very characteristic of our time makes race, racism, whiteness, blackness into uh, the, uh, the the central theme of what is really a much more nuanced, uh, you know, uh, a complex uh, uh, historical dynamic, something like that. Mm. Well, I, I think I can hear some of the people you're talking about uh, right now replying that they actually do have a narrative having to do with the settlement of the West that is consistent with the narrative uh, that, 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 that's being advanced in the 1619 project. But the um, but that aside, there, there's a question I was going to I was going to ask you that I think you may have partly answered at the beginning of uh, your last answer. And this actually emerged in conversation with the aforementioned. Nikita, this morning when I told him I was going to be having this conversation with you, yeah. it has to do with the importance of positive narratives. I, I think one thing you don't like about, uh, I mean, aside from what you've already said about what you don't like about the consequences of, of the 1619 narrative, um, I, I think it's your view that, you know, nations need positive narratives. Uh, America needs a positive narrative. And, and there are a lot of contexts in which you need a positive narrative. Um, the question that arose was, and again, I think you started to answer it maybe, and, and you may have already answered it elsewhere, but um, in terms of the message you would like to present, say, to young African-Americans who are born uh, in 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 poverty or born in the inner city where this the set of uh, incentives is that they face is not healthy. Um, what is the what's the most positive way you would frame what you have to say to them? I mean, I know I know there are a series of kind of affirmative exhortations, right? Like, you know, tuck your shirt in, you know, sh show up for that job interview. Quit whining, however you would put it, uh, you know, I, and, and if I'm caricaturing your view, feel free to tell me. But but you know no. what I mean? I mean, I mean, there, there are a series of exhortations. Yeah. But is there a um, how would you put the inspiring 
narrative? Well, yeah, there are exhortations. So at the personal level, what do you need to do? So uh, clean up your act, uh, stand up straight with your shoulders back, as Jordan Peterson put it. <laughs> but you know what I mean? There, there's that, there's that stick. Um, it's a great country. It's a free and it's an open society. It's not a perfect country, uh, but it's a great country and there's tremendous opportunity here. Uh, it, you know, I, I'd want to tell the story. I mean, when Myrdal was uh, writing about the American Negro at mid 20th century, this is Gunnar Myrdal, the American dilemma, mm -hmm. et cetera. You know, the typical job for a black woman was domestic servant. Typical job for a black man was some kind of laborer in the industry or on a farm somewhere. I mean, I'm talking about 40 or 50 percent of the working population in 1940 were doing jobs like that. Um, the, you know, there weren't any black billionaires or very, very, very few equivalent of that achievement at that time in history. There were huge swaths of the country where people couldn't vote. They talk about voter suppression now, and what they mean is they move the polling place or they ask someone for an ID. They don't mean what it used to mean when you couldn't actually vote. Um, you would go into corporate suites. They would be lily white. You turn on the television. It was lily white. This is within my lifetime. These are real things. The, you know, the, the fact that we have such a short memory, you know, doesn't wipe out what actually has been achieved. Uh, and I would want to reframe the story if Colin Kaepernick is pissed off, as he has every right to be, about a cop shooting a kid who didn't have a weapon somewhere in America. And uh, he wants everybody to know that he's pissed off. Don't make the site, this is me. Don't make the site of your protest the national anthem's uh, acknowledgement. The country is not fundamentally flawed. The country, as history has demonstrated in the last 75 years, has a, an enormous capacity for uh, institutional and attitudinal transformation. You need the country in order to get anything done that you actually want to get done, whether it's police reform, health care, uh, in minimum wage, what, whatever. What, what, you want attention to the poverty in the inner cities and the housing project, you need the country. So don't get, don't arrogate to yourself this presumption of uh, moral rectitude that has you giving the back of your hand to the citizens whose support you ultimately need in order to, uh, to engage. So I, I don't know if I'm responding to you now. What would I tell the kid? I, I tell the kid, not the reason that you should do what I'm telling you to do, clean up your act, stand up straight with your shoulders back, stay in school, uh, don't get into trouble, et cetera. It's because basically the American dream is not a fraud as ta Coates uh, would have it. The American dream is real. It's being realized by millions and tens of millions as we speak. We are a beacon to the entire world, and you have a birthright citizenship here, an entitlement here. This is your home. This is your country. Your race is a part of the social reality, but there's a lot of stuff that's a part of the social reality. It does not define you, et cetera. Uh, I can go on with the speech for a long time, but I think you see how it goes. Okay. Well, one reason I, I I'm interested in the question of how you how you frame a positive narrative is um, I have my own hobby horses. Uh, the and I had said, you know, uh, as you, as you had known when we started this, I wanted to spend a little time on stuff I'm doing, and yeah. uh, it has to do with this. Uh, well, I I I have a newsletter. It's called the Non Zero Newsletter. It's um, I wrote a book called Non-Zero that came out. I'm having uh, trouble grasping the reality of this, but it came out 21 years ago. Uh, it's funny. I remember, you know, when I was, uh, uh, did you know William McNeil, the historian? Did you know him or know of him? He was, he wrote The Rise of the West. He was. Uh, I did not know him. He was, he was at the University of Chicago, one of the last historians who was allowed to do big think, I think, uh, you know, huge grand vision picture of history and grand. Is he the author of uh, the Holocaust in American life? 
I don't think so. He wrote. Okay, I, uh, th- th- there's another historian at Chicago who I. I, I his, his most famous book is The Rise of the West. Uh, okay. In any case. Well, anyway, while I was, I was working on the book. This was earlier than 2000 when the book came out. Yeah. And he is he has since passed away. Uh, he was at this point, uh, maybe uh, in his 80s, uh, late 70s or something. And he, and he said he said we were talking on the phone. We had never met. And he said, how old are you? And I said. 43. And he said, you're at the height of your powers. <laughs> and, and that was about right. I now realize, in other words, you know, you, you're not as sharp analytically as you might have been. And you're, you know, when mathematicians peak in their 20s, sure. yeah. but you've acquired this knowledge, maybe a certain amount of wisdom. And yet your analytical game hasn't fallen off a whole lot. Your memory hasn't fallen. You know, it's so, yeah. so like he nailed it anyway. It has been 21 years, at least, since I was at the height of my powers, apparently. That's a digression. Um, the, the, the book, uh, how should I put this? So I've just, the newsletter I've been putting out for a few years and have built up, a, you know, a, a fairly large, e, by my standards, email base, like 19,000 uh, subscribers, but it's, it's free. It's been free. Uh, a few weeks ago, I started a paid version of the newsletter. This is all on Substack, where most people's newsletters are these days. Yeah. And I'm describing the paid version as being kind of uh, the location of what I'm calling the Apocalypse Aversion Project. <laughs> you got to save the world, huh? Well, you said you earlier laughed about y- your, you sounding grandiose as if you want to save civilization. And I, and I thought at that point, I thought, he doesn't know grandiose. You want to hear grandiose? I can do Apocalypse grandiose. Aversion. <laughs> so the logic, just quickly, the, the, the thesis of non, non-zero was an account of how, um, well, kind of how we got to, to globalization. It was a story of humankind that starts, you know, like 20,000 years ago or more when the most complex uh, human social organization as a hunter-gatherer village, traces the growth in the scope and depth of social complexity to where we are. Um, And it has a kind of a game theoretical explanation of it, having to do with the way technology keeps providing uh, new kinds of non-zero-sum opportunities. Uh, I I like to think it's not naive or simplistic. There's a big role for zero-sum dynamics uh, in life. And in fact, uh, you know, competition has, has been a big, a big force in, in, in the kind of evolution of human society to where we are now to the the level of globalization. But the argument was, look, now we're on, we're, we're kind of at the threshold of having a global community. We're not there. We do not have a world full of peacefully interacting and cooperating when necessary nations. And that's a shame because technology is presenting more and more non-zero-sum problems. Well, pandemics, uh, climate change, climate, yeah. un- unconstrained arms uh, development, uh, you know, in the realm of biological weapons, yeah. weapons in space, um, yeah. you know, and, and, and new technologies like the danger of things like uh, genetic engineering or artificial intelligence evolving in a context of intense international competition among nations. You can just imagine things kind of going right. So there's lots of cases uh, for needing more in the way of cooperation, of international governance, international accords. And the argument was, if we don't understand that, if we don't you know, respond wisely to non-zero-sum dynamics, the whole thing could spiral downward rapidly. You can imagine various forms of global chaos um, and that's what I mean by, uh, you know, I'm being a little lighthearted when I refer to it as the apocalypse. I mean, as I guess as lighthearted as you can be about something that great. But but I, but I do mean I think there's a real chance for uh, chaos. And when I say apocalypse aversion project, I mean, first of all, I'm averse to, to this version of the apocalypse, but also it'd be nice to avert it to 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 uh, figure out ways um, for it not to happen. And I should say that I think the challenge goes beyond policy, although policy is a huge part. But I think because of 
what you and I have been talking about, which is more and more um, just strife between various kinds of tribes, including ideological tribes, including nations. Um, the, the, there's a kind of psychological adjustment that we need that, that I think uh, sometimes I think it's so profound what's needed that um, that even a secular person might be willing to call it spiritual, if that makes any sense. I mean, a really a reexamination of the way you relate to other human beings and a much greater expenditure uh, on behalf of the goal of understanding how the world looks to them. You know, cognitive empathy, just perspective taking. So. This is my obsession. It's what it's what this new, the, you know, the paid version of the newsletter is. Well, I actually am. Uh, I'll stop. I'll stop here for now. But um, uh, but but I'm curious about your reaction to that, and uh, it relates to a lot of things we've been talking about. I think, including how do you develop a positive message? How do you get people motivated to work toward a goal that might seem remote? Uh, and uh, overwhelming in, uh, or daunting or something. Okay, well, you know, it's a lot to react to off the cuff. Um, uh, I'm heartened to know that you're thinking big. That, <laughs> That's never been a problem with me, Glenn. Well, okay, <laughs> but you've also delivered, uh, you know, it's 21 years, and so we're still waiting for the next book, Bob. I know there's been a book not, since that. Not true. Book. There have been two. There have been two. Okay. Don't sell well, me short. I meant, I meant about this problem. Well, the, the last book, which was modestly titled Why Buddhism is True, and was a reference strictly to this, this so-called secular or naturalistic part of Buddhism. It was about yes. why uh, meditation, if it gives you a gives you a clearer view of the world in my in my view and so on. But But that was not unrelated because... I'll shut up in a second, but th that was um, very much about how one way, not the only way, but one way of achieving a state of mind that is more conducive to understanding among human beings and solving problems rather than making them worse. I, I would even say that the, the book before that, The Evolution of God, was in a way an extension of non-zero. But anyway, okay. sorry, I just... Uh, no, that's that's good. I the universe begins to take shape here, uh, why Buddhism is true. Um, and it seems to me, and now I give an economist kind of response, so the, the problem in cooperative game theory where we can all get together and enjoy a bigger surplus if we cooperate than if we compete with each other is the arranging so that the sh everybody can be assured that when the surplus is shared or the burdens are born and that they get a good deal out of it. And uh, that can be an insurmountable problem under some circumstances. So uh, that, that suggests that transformative uh, solutions where the very preferences of the agents are the subject of manipulation rather than contracts or agreements about uh, uh, transfers. But what do we want? So for example, in the climate problem, I mean, we can think about it in terms of, well, we have to put less carbon in the atmosphere. The world will not stand it if we don't do that. And then who goes first and who's the one that's going to pay the cost of that becomes mm -hmm. a really big deal. Or we can think about it in terms of, do we all have to fly across the Atlantic twice a year? Do, does everybody have to have an air conditioning to 70 degrees uh, when the temperature outside is 90? Uh, you know, do we, can we live our lives kind of within a hundred mile radius of uh, where we were born and, and, and nevertheless be fulfilled a different way of living. If I've got a globe where some countries are very rich and advanced and other countries are, as it were, coming into the modern world and, and people are coming out of villages in the tens and hundreds of millions, do they all have to have air conditioners? Does everybody have to pave over mm -hmm. highways and put cars? But I can't ask them to live a, a way that's different from the way that I'm living, so it kind of it's a much more fundamental challenge to to ask us to look within at how it is that we perceive our fulfillment uh, and and uh, happiness being attained, and to question and interrogate whether that is a part of the problem, rather rather than saying pointing the finger at the guy across the road and saying that he has to use less or 
whatever. Yeah. So, so, so uh, I mean, I, I can see the, the ambition, the intellectual ambition, and I see why spiritual might be the right word to put on a program which, which makes as its focus changing the way we think about how, what, what a good life is and how we'll be fulfilled in that life uh, as a way of mitigating the worst downside from us uh, com- conflicting with each other. I give climate as an example of that. Yeah, it's, and it's only one. I mean, I think it's actually one of the few problems of this type that has actually gotten uh, close to as much you know, attention as it deserves. I mean, I mean even people who, who think it's not a problem are at least aware of it. Uh, and, uh, and you're right, the, you know, the perspective taking is a challenge here because from the point of view of nations that have been developing and are now on the verge of prosperity, or even say in the case of China, have attained a fair amount of it, they're like, wait a second, when you were in the process of developing, you were yeah. just spewing stuff with total yeah. disregard. So can yeah. we just do that during the stage of our development that's comparable to the stage of development uh, during which you did that? And so it's a it's a very challenging thing. And, you know, you're right. Collective action is a huge problem. And, and it is also deepened by. Uh, well, I mean, Trump's an interesting case because, you know, some of the things he said about like NATO, you know, we're right. I I mean, look, it's, it's, uh, um, NATO is a collaborative enterprise. The burden should be borne equally. And, and ultimately the United States built it, uh, in part to serve American interests and, and that should continue to happen. Um, on the other hand, Trump was broadly speaking, kind of anti-international governance. Right. And I don't. So. So. So I don't think he kind of recognized problems where you do need uh, various kinds of um, of alliance. Uh, And I think he just, you know, uh, created such an air of antagonism that was hard. It was hard to get any any work done. Um, I, I guess I would like I guess I would like people to become more aware of how their ability to see things from the point of view of the other person is shaped by how that other person is being, or that other group is being framed to them. I mean, there's a, there's a, a kind of a, 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 I think an under, an under discussed cognitive bias called attribution error, where it turns out that once you, once you think people, once you have somebody in the enemy box, okay, well, I'll just do the sh- the shortest version of it. It, it, it. I won't even describe the the, the cognitive bias. I've, I've I've written about it. I'll write about it more. But one effect of it is that once somebody you you're can you put them in the enemy box, it's actually very hard to do a good job of perspective taking of understanding how things look from their point of view. And yet, that's important, even with adversaries and enemies, to understand where they're coming from. And I guess I'd like. Uh, I'd like people to be more aware of the way various international actors and groups and nations, the way they're framing in media and so on, uh, affects our ability to think about their perspective. That, that's all pretty abstract, maybe too abstract, but. Well, I want to ask you a couple of questions. What, what is uh, the role of nationalism in, in your scheme of things? And, and what about identity politics? That's at the subnational level but people understanding themselves in uh, relatively identitarian terms. Mm. Is, is this a, a problem for you? And what would you, what would you, how would you approach it? And, and about nations, because I can remember this coming up in a previous conversation we had where I say, you like welfare state, you want to take care of the poor, you better will have a border. You better have some sense of mm-hmm. national understanding of the cooperative enterprise of that state not of the globe, but of that state. And yet the national uh, fervor is uh, the same thing that you end up going to war on behalf of or not, yeah. not wanting the other guy to, to beat you out. So it, it seems inconsistent with non-zero-ness uh, <laughs> at some level and yet essential to implementing 
cooperative at the level of the at the nation state kind of uh, yeah. policy? Well, I think, first of all, nation states are going to be essential building blocks for as far as I can see into the future. I mean, they, they are going to be fundamentally important actors who are choosing or not choosing to enter into cooperative arrangements with other nation states to solve problems. That's not the only dimension where things happen. Philanthropies can do things, corporations can do things, but I think nation states are gonna be very important. So their cohesion is important. And this is one reason America's current situation bothers me. We don't, we don't have enough cohesion to get anything in particular done, uh, so far as I can tell, or to get much done. Um, and that requires, and you know, part of it, having a nation state is having people identify with it. Now, as for nationalism, you know, people sometimes make a distinction between nationalism and patriotism. I, I don't know how you want to do the labels. I think we'd all agree that there are benign and healthy forms of identifying with your nation and being proud of it. And then there are forms of it that are pathological, right? And history is, is full of those as well. And which, you know, what, what you want to label those things is up, uh, is up to you. Um, I guess I, um, it's just too often in the interest of politicians to bring out uh, the path, at least some of the pathological part of nationalism than I'm comfortable with. It's an easy way. Uh, it's an easy way for a politician to succeed in many, many countries. I wish, by the way, that we were more aware of how we are sometimes doing a favor to authoritarians abroad when we help them stir up nationalism, you know, in China and places like that. If, if we seem uh, if we seem too contemptuous or oppressive or whatever, uh, that's going to strengthen the authoritarian leader politically often by stirring up nationalism. But, you know, on the identity politics thing, I mean, first of all, my own political diagnosis as somebody who generally votes for Democrats is I wish the Democrats would move away from identity politics toward a class based politics, a more traditional leftist politics where it's like workers of the world unite. And um, and I mean, I'm getting ahead of the story because I take I take the phrase workers of the world unite a little more seriously than some people, because I, I do think I mean, I've said that we're going to have to see more international governance. I think we're going to have to see a little more left leaning uh, governance. And here again, I'm going to find myself saying th something positive about Donald Trump now. Uh, he th there's a, an obscure provision he worked into the uh, his version of NAFTA that had to do with. Um, it was an incentive for increasing wages in Mexican auto plants. It was a rule about how if autos are going to trade freely within North America, then X percent of the car has to have been built in factories paying an average of sixteen dollars an hour or something like that. So this was. This was um, both an incentive to raise wages in Mexico, which would take some of the competitive pressure off of American workers, or if they don't raise the wages, it still helps American workers, right? So, uh, and, and this was a case where uh, the leftists in, 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 in Mexico were by and large behind this because they're like the people who'd be supporting a minimum wage and they saw it uh, yeah. as doing that. And I, I think we're gonna have to see in trade agreements, including at the, in the WTO, more serious addressing of both environmental problems and of labor issues. I, I, I don't mean you're going to magically go to like a, you know, a, a global minimum wage uh, within my lifetime or necessarily ever, but I think uh, there's going to have to be creative thought along those lines. But to, but to, to get back to the national see if level, I'm understanding, rather than pitting American factory workers against Mexican factory workers, this view would pit workers, in effect, against manufacturers, capitalists, yeah. the, the bosses, uh, and trade agreements would be calibrated, at least to some degree, to accommodate this transnational labor uh, ad, uh, uh, affirmation. Yeah, I mean, we've been saying this for, we always say there will be labor accords, you know, and there will be environmental accords. 
they said that about NAFTA from the beginning. And I think NAFTA did have some weak language about the right of Mexican workers to organize or something. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what it was, but it was there's a certain amount of kind of inconsequential language about the right to organize and so on that you see in international agreements. But this thing that Trump did Actually, it may not have much impact given where they set the numbers, but it was the kind of thing that could in principle have some teeth, especially if you had a, an adjudicatory mechanism uh, in, to handle uh, cases of uh, not complying with it. But, um, but yeah, the idea is it's like it is in the common interest of American workers and at least most Mexican workers to say elevate the minimum wage in Mexico. Now, as you know, as an economist, there's this trade off and you say, well, wait. Don't you have fewer jobs than in Mexico? And the answer tends to be a minimum wage helps a lot of workers a little and, a, and it hurts a smaller number of workers. workers and, and that's life. But la the labor movement still tends to support it. And it would in Mexico. So, yes, we're talking about a commonality of interest between American and Mexican workers. I mean, this is not like a huge part of my worldview at all. But part of my an important part of my worldview is taking seriously international governance in realms of arms control of various kinds, environmental stuff. Uh, but, you know, this is I, I also bring this up in recognition of the fact that a big problem. Well. I want to see national cohesion. You have to have nation states playing the, the international non zero sum games. And if American workers feel that international commerce does nothing but rip them off and send their jobs abroad, that's bad for America. And, 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 and it makes it hard um, to be cohesive. And whereas if you could say, look, we're starting to develop some trade agreements that you know, preserve some of the benefits of trade, like you still get a cheaper smartphone than you would if there were no international trade, but buffers you from at least some of the downside, I think that's a, that's a better message. Have you seen uh, Michael Sandel's book, uh, The Tyranny of Merit? I have not seen it. I, uh, I assume Tom well, Friedman has by now quoted it. So that's the first thing I should do is go look up Tom Friedman's quoting him. He's a, I, I didn't know he had. I don't follow Tom, Tom Friedman. And, yeah, he's a reliable uh, quoter of Michael Sandel. But no, no. So tell uh, me oh, about I see. it. That's a, that's a joke I didn't get. No. So Sandel also has something kind of backhandedly good to say about Trump, which is what made me think about it. So, I mean, he says, and this is my paraphrase, and I'm only on chapter four. I haven't finished the entire book, but I think I've got the, the driving idea. He says, uh, globalization creates winners and losers across the planet. And uh, the, the winners tend to be the coastal elites in the United States or the people who were uh, against uh, Brexit in uh, the UK or whatever. They're professionals. They work like this with their fingers at a at a monitor, they're in finance, they're in their engineers or architectural firms, they're lawyers who are doing deals, they are, you know, whatever. They're, they're global elites. They move fast uh, uh, in, in uh, response to the changing economic terrain and they are being, and they are getting paid and they're pulling away. Inequality is increasing. Um, and how do they think about their success? Well, they got degrees from here and there, they work very hard, they, they arrogate to themselves uh, the, the, the presumption that their success is due to their merit. It's due to their effort. And what's the hidden message of that arrogation? It's that the losers, the ones who are in these dusty towns that are drying up everywhere where uh, the companies have gone abroad and whatnot, the ones who are 58 years old and all they knew was working in that plant, and now the plan is gone and, they, and somebody's telling them to retool. They can become, uh, they can write code. They can, you know, they can go to a, a phone center and, you know, and, 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 and the, the irrigation of the winners, the presumption of them uh, meriting their success is that the losers also merited their failure. So, so there's this idea of personal responsibility. He's against equal opportunity. He thinks equal opportunity is problematic. Because equal opportunity implicitly assumes that the inequality of the outcome after you've secured equal opportunity is fine. Well, what about the fact that some of those people who succeeded were lucky, even if they were lucky to be as particularly adept as they were at the specialized activity that they're engaged in? Still, they didn't do anything to get those talents except to have them bequeathed. He, he says, 
the the need, the political solidarity needed for us to together weather the storm of uh, of globalization. It's a catastrophe for some and an opportunity for others. Is undermined by these narratives of justified success, which have the mm -hmm. implicit backstory of justified failure, and that we need to move away from that toward uh, a, a more solidaristic. Uh, now, I haven't gotten to the part where it tells me exactly how we're going to do that yeah. uh, as, as a political reality. But the normative argument, the, the, the kind of ethical, philosophical argument, is that your presumption that you're entitled to success, that you earned it, that you merit mm -hmm. it, that's a tyrannical, he calls it meritocratic hubris. He says, you're, you're awash in meritocratic hubris. Uh, you know, so. Yeah. No, I kind of agree. I mean, when I, you know, the word privilege has become a prominent one. Yeah. And when I think about, like, am I a beneficiary of privilege? I mean, if you consider my current circumstances desirable, yes, obviously, in some sense. I mean, I, I mean, first of all, I'm sure, yeah, white privilege. Yeah, yeah, I'm white. And I'm sure there have been cases with that help. But just more broadly speaking, obviously, I was born in circumstances that allowed me that led me in the direction I wound yeah. up in. And they weren't they were not particularly uh, objectively auspicious circumstances. I mean, we weren't poor, but it wasn't like. I mean, let me put it this way. Three of my four siblings voted for Trump. OK, so it wasn't I, I wasn't we're not talking about a bunch of kids who are who are sent to, to you know, East Coast prep schools. Um, but at the same time. Yeah, I must have I, I, I can tell you a billion ways I've been lucky or uh, it, it just seems to me. I mean, I basically agree with Sandell's point. I'm, I, I'm curious as to what you think about it. Um, but. You know, um, and I've heard people say, uh, well, I fought my way to the top. Um, why can't yeah. why haven't they done it? My answer is, well, obviously you were born with, you know, I don't mean genes necessarily. You were born with, you know, whether it was a particular ethos, somebody you knew instilled yeah. in you or something that you I could, I'm sure I could go back and find a place where you were privileged to be where you were at that time does it now do, what what is your reaction to sandell's yeah i mean there's no reason to exclude genes although i wouldn't leave it at genes i mean genes are a part of the story of uh differences in, at individuals uh talents and gifts that allow them to succeed but only a part of the story but even if it's only the capacity and the willingness to work hard i mean at some level you could yeah. You know, you could say that that was uh, the good fortune to have been so constituted that, you know, you uh, are able to discipline yourself in this way. Uh, my reaction, to, I, I'm, I'm uh, chastened by uh, Michael's argument as much of it as I've absorbed to date. I'm reading it together with my, my lovely wife, Lawan, who I have sometimes mentioned here at the Glenn Show. She's, uh, she's a Bernie Sanders Democrat. And uh, she's God an amazing her. cook. She's an amazing cook. And so when she's composing some of these meals to which I have very little to contribute except chopping up onions, I will open up the book and start reading it out loud. And that's the kind of one of hmm. the things that we do. So she's cheering every time Michael Sandel says, uh, you think you work, you think you earned it on your own. You think you got it because of your hard work, which is a formulation that I am given frequently to invoke. Mm -hmm. You know, and I could go into the story, but you know the story. So I worked hard to get where I am, very hard to get where I am. I earned my success, et cetera, et cetera. That's a speech I could give in my sleep. And Sandel is saying, whoa, 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 hold on a minute, hold on a minute. There are both normative and political implications of you taking that stand. I want you to think mm -hmm. very hard about it before you go down that road. So I'm a bit chastened by that and, and made to think, okay, uh, I there's something there that I really want to take seriously and take on board, give me a chance to process it. On the other hand, I do worry that the narrative that you tell to someone, work hard, keep your nose to the ground, so stand up straight with your shoulders back, study, save, be disciplined, right. et cetera, has behavioral consequences, that, that's, that that gets people to work hard and that yeah. hard work is a good thing. 
I, I mean, that I, I don't want to quite follow Michael all the way to what looks to be the the implication of where he's going. I, I do want to hold a lawbreaker responsible. Mm -hmm. I, I want to say he had a choice. Michael almost is telling me you too could have been that lawbreaker. It's just it's not it has got anything to do with your character. It, it, it has merely to do with your good fortune. And you need to be in solidarity with the lawbreaker because it could have been you there, but for the grace of God, go you. And I want to say, well, no, I want to hold him responsible. That's my that's my kind of yeah. resistance. It's a difficult thing because you don't want to undermine people's sense of agency. Right. I mean, my view, I do carry Sandel's view into the question of crime and punishment. But what I say is, uh, look, as a practical matter, you you do have to punish people who do bad things. The question is why you're doing it. And, and I think the reason you shouldn't do it is for retribution. Yeah. I think you should confine it to its practical value. You, 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 you put people in prison because it keeps them off the streets. If there's a good chance that they would repeat the crime and because it is a deterrent, the knowledge yeah. that people go to prison. And, you know, if you look at it, if you, if you look at, uh, but but I think you should take retribution. In other words, the idea of punishment being a good in and of itself. Like if you do the thought experiment, you find somebody on a desert island who committed some horrible crime. They've never been punished. You have the capacity to inflict suffering on them as punishment, but it won't do any good because nobody will ever find out about it. They can't harm anyone. Do you punish them? I say no. That would be sheerly retributive punishment. But if you look at the people we do punish. Um, I mean, American law does respect retribution technically as one of the, 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 the rationales for punishment. But if you look at the people, I, I'm mainly saying that if you adopted Sandel's view here, it wouldn't make much practical difference. If you look at the people we do hold accountable for their crimes and punish, they're pretty much, by and large, the same people we would hold accountable if you took retribution out of the picture and focus on the practical consequences of punishment. My view is that punishment is always an unfortunate necessity, but is, is sometimes a necessity. I don't think the death penalty would pass muster with your, with your view. Well, you could imagine, I mean, I'm against the death penalty, but you can imagine a world in which they had empirically shown yeah, but that I, for I, every I, one murderer executed, like uh, thousands yeah. were deterred from committing murder. That's my murder. point. I think the evidence yeah. there is not there for that. I agree. For that I claim. agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, but, you know, on the uh, to get back to your wife briefly, uh, you said she's a Sanders <laughs> supporting Democrat. She is. The, the phrase I forgot to mention when I said um, I'd like to see Democrats move uh, away from identity politics toward class-based uh, politics. I said workers of the world unite. What I didn't say is workers of America unite, right? Like if the Democrats want to have a pitch that is appealing to at least some potential Trump voters in the white working class, I recommend they focus on bringing, you know, material benefits to to people of lower income and uh, not just material in the you know, in the simple sense, but, you know, things like educational opportunity, vocational training, job opportunities, uh, people of all ethnicities sure. who are uh, who are in those those economic and, and and social circumstances. But they're not going in that direction, Bob. No, uh, they're not. Racial I, I, equity will be the foundation of everything we do in this government. That's a paraphrase of what President Biden has actually said. And the anti-Trump reaction, Trump has been driven from office, everything that he was for, and we know he was a white supremacist, and we know he spoke for these people, uh, uh, animus, and the, the uh, identitarian basis of Biden's own political success, and, you know, from the South Carolina primary forward, mm -hmm. uh, the people who are going to be put into important positions in uh, uh, the administration having to do with these kinds of policies, uh, it, it suggests that that they're they're not going to take this uh, you know class ahead of race framework uh, very far at all. Hmm. Well, I mean, they are pursuing some class-based policies 
you could say health care is one, although that one is not as dramatic as I would like to see it. Yeah. But it's true. I mean, in terms of courting Trump voters, it's also true that separate from the challenge of just, you know, coming up with policies that bring them benefits. There's a fact that I think a certain amount of them are or a certain number of them are quite put off by identity politics rhetoric. Right. And yeah. and I, I think one thing that's happened is that Democrats have become a little more aware of the possibility that um, some of the identity politics they're being encouraged to pursue are not all that big among the ethnic groups they had thought would be gratified by them uh, and sometimes are more of a hobby horse of the elites of that ethnic group or Indeed. the liberal elites of that ethnic group. I think, you know, there was a lot of uh, discussion of voting patterns among Latinos along the uh, Texas border who didn't didn't vote for Biden in the numbers that were hoped. And, you know, obviously, if you took a poll and asked them how they feel about the word Latinx, right? Like, should we refer to use Latinx? Most yeah. of them would would say, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that word. I, I, well, I'll tell you some things I would like. I'd like better schools. Yeah. I'd like better health care. You know, I, I, I think I hope some awareness of that is uh, is dawning on, on more Democrats. That. I got to ask you a question, Bob, if I can, before we go. Sure. Uh, so uh, you've been getting some blowback about uh, the kind of new direction that uh, the Blogging Heads Enterprise has taken. Uh, and uh, how, how do you process that? And you mean the the Patreon model or the? Yeah, I, I mean the Patreon model, and and also the fact that sometimes you have people like me at your platform who oh. uh, have said things about Trump that uh, people get upset with, and they wonder whether or not your platform has become uh, insufficiently, I don't know, uh, insufficiently anti-Trump. Yeah. For example, I'm pretty, I don't want it to make it only Trump. I mean, I'm pretty anti-Trump. Uh, the uh, yeah, let me let me. Um, a couple of things. I mean, the the, the uh, you and there's also the Patreon issue. There's that. Let me let me just do very quickly. Blogging heads when when we started it 15 years ago, and by the way, even then there were audio downloads. So I like to think of this as one of the world's oldest podcasting platforms. Uh, now most of our uh, uh, on balance, I would say uh, most of our traffic is 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 audio podcasting. Um, the uh, but we saw a very prominent uh, you know uh, video uh, uh, manifestation on YouTube and on the site. But but the the deal and, and now, as people know, uh, some of us are are moving toward a kind of a Patreon crowdfunding model. The reason I'm you know fine with that and have to some extent encouraged it is because. Back when blogging heads was more unusual, 15, 10, 15, even even five, six, seven years ago, it was easier to get philanthropic funding. We got grants from foundations and so on. We still get a little of that. But now that everyone has a podcast, it's kind of a harder pitch to make. So we're that's the reason we're moving to a crowdfunding model, just to keep keep the thing, uh, keep the thing around on the ideology. um, You know, I have my own Friday podcast with. Mickey Kaus, who's one of the co-founders of Blogging Heads, who voted for Trump twice. OK, so uh, it's not as if your show is the only source of the kind of feedback you described. Um, the uh, I, I would say, first of all, there are other things on. Uh, I mean, first of all, I personally have. Uh, I make a point of having a diversity of views on my, my show is the right show. That's the podcast feed. That's my show. This show will go out on that feed, but this show will go out on your feed as well. And is officially your show. The, um, the, the conversation we're having now, um, the, uh, I, I make a point to have a diversity. I have had, uh, neoconservatives, Bill Crystal, David from, even though there is I think it's fair to say no foreign policy perspective to which I am more opposed <laughs> in America, <laughs> neoconservatism. And I think I've made that clear on the left. I've had, uh, you know, people you talk about blowback. 
when I have had like Max Blumenthal, Aaron Mate or Mate, I think you pronounce it on uh, from uh, the you might say the uh, vociferous left. I've also had Glenn Greenwald. He doesn't get quite the kind of blowback they get. But I, I, I just um, uh, I try to. I try to make a point of doing something I think is more important even than it used to be, which is trying to have a diversity of conversations and try to treat the people you're talking with respectfully. Um, and then, by the way, there's a great show, the DMZ, uh, Bill Shear, Matt Lewis, and they are one's kind of left, one's kind of right, but neither is pro-Trump. They're both they're both basically anti-Trump. And that's there. Um you know, Ari Cohen Wade has a show called Culturally Determined, which brings in a lot of people who certainly, you know, th there is there is a fair amount of diversity as things stand. I would like to see more diversity of perspective. But I got to say, if you look at the conversations we've had over the last year, I think just about every base you can identify has been covered. I've had the, the editor of Jacobin. I've had the editor of Current Affairs. Those are the two main socialist magazines. Um, uh, so I, I, don't, um, I don't feel I have anything to particularly apologize for. I think you are a very constructive voice in the conversation, and I'm proud of any role we played. Um, and and it, as I said, if I have a regret, it's that some of the people you take issue with seem not willing to have a conversation with you. I'm sure you'd, you'd treat them very well if they came on your show. You'd probably willing to be willing to go on another show to talk to them. All that would be great. Um, and, you know, I'm a big believer in trying to work to see things from the point of view of the other side. Uh, and that's that's what blogging heads has always been about. We don't always have the optimal balance. Um, but I think we've stayed more or less true to the mission. Okay. Well, Bob, I thank you for suggesting that you come on the Glenn show. Uh, well, I thank you for having me, Glenn and congratulations on, uh, your, your, your growing, uh, and I've got the numbers. I can tell people it's literally true. You're 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 growing a prominence and influence. I'm. It, it's great to see what you're doing. Thanks, Bob. It's great to have been working with you these decade plus years, and I'm looking forward to another decade or so. God willing, as God, we say. God willing, as we say. Yes, me too. <laughs>